Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts of praise, Hallelujah. Well, friends, I trust this finds you feeling happy in Jesus this morning. Do you have that sweet confidence resting in the base of your soul, knowing that you are at peace with God? Well, I trust you do, friends. Now, we know that in order to grow in the Lord, we must be reading and applying his word to our lives each and every day. And that's why we're here this morning. We're continuing our study through the book of Romans, and today we find ourselves in a very interesting passage, which is going to be Romans chapter 7. Now, many read this and automatically apply it to our earthly lives, our earthly relationships, but you must understand that Paul is simply using an illustration from an earthly relationship to identify our relationship with the Lord Jesus. So to help you better understand that, let's just pick up in verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, know ye not, sisters, for I speak to those who know the law. So again, he is writing to Jewish believers, young Jewish believers who are setting aside their Jewish traditions, and they're now adhering to and conforming their lives to the teachings of the Lord Jesus. And so he says, Know ye not, brothers and sisters, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? And this is a question that Paul is asking. And so he says, let me explain to you through an illustration that I know that you can understand. The woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. As long as he lives, no matter how troubled the marriage becomes, she is bound to her husband unless, as the Lord Jesus taught, sexual promiscuity or adultery is committed. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Now, as this is an illustration, let's make a few minor changes here and let's go back and look at this. Now, I want you to be the woman. The Bible tells us that we are the bride of Christ. Jesus is the husbandman. We are the bride. So we take the female role in the relationship. So when we read in Ephesians, for example, and it talks about a woman's submission unto her husband, let us not be so quick to point the finger in applying this to our own earthly relationships. But as it says in chapter 5, verse 22, let's read it like this. Wives or Christians Submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Your husband is the Lord Jesus. For the husband, the Lord Jesus, is the head of the wife, or he's the head of the Christian. You see, Paul's using the same example to illustrate the same fact. And so back to Romans chapter 7, when we read verse 2, we read, For the woman, or the Christian, who has a husband, is bound by the law, to her husband so long as he lives. In other words, the Jew was bound by the law as long as Jesus lived. But if the husband be dead, when Jesus died upon the cross, she or the Jew is now loosed from the law of her husband. And so Paul understands how difficult it is for them to set aside the law because that has been their tradition for so long. And yet he's saying there's something very mystical. And I hate to use that word because of the way we identify it today. But it is so true in its context, friends. There was something very mystical, very supernatural that took place on that cross. And so he continues in verse 3 and he says, So then, while her husband lives, if she shall be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. Now think about this in your relationship as a Christian. If you identify yourself with another husbandman, if you give yourself to some other passion, some other desire, if you pursue something other than the Lord Jesus, you will become a spiritual adulteress. And this is where Paul is going to bring the illustration home to us when he says in verse 4, 
Wherefore, in other words, because I've said this to you, my brothers and sisters, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. You're no longer married to this world. And as Sarah called her husband Abram master, we learn from that that the one we're married to, our husbandman, is our master. And now that we identify with Jesus Christ, we are no longer under our old master, the world. And because of this, we should bring forth fruit unto God. In Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8, God illustrates this again as he says, I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery. Well, all of Israel didn't go out physically and commit adultery, so the Lord is speaking spiritually here. And he said, because she committed adultery, I had to put her away. So I gave her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. So we can see here the Lord is trying to get us to understand something. When we commit ourselves unto the Lord Jesus, we have made a commitment that is just as legal and binding as a certificate of marriage. We have entered into a new relationship. And when we give ourselves to the things of this world, we're committing spiritual adultery against our husbandman, the Lord Jesus. And that's what Paul is trying to explain to these young believers. He says in verse 5, when we were in the flesh, when we were under our old master, the world, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Now, Paul understands it is at this point that the reader might say, well, then the law doesn't exist anymore. The law isn't important because the law brings forth death and death is the wages of sin, then the law is sin. But Paul says, no, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust or covetousness, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So the law is our schoolmaster teaching us what is right and what is wrong. But sin in verse 8, taken occasion by the commandment or by the law, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, which is simply the diseased condition of the soul to desire things that appeal to us and satisfy us rather than offering ourselves as slaves unto God and unto others, taking a servant mentality. And Paul says in verse 12, the law is holy. The commandment is holy. It is just and it is good. And he says in verse 22, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. However, I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Why? Because in verse 15, that that I would do, I do not do. And what I hate, that is the thing that I do. Paul is simply recognizing that there is a battle going on within him a desire from the mind to do the things that are pleasing to God, but the flesh warring against him. And even when he does good in verse 21, evil is present. Why? Because of the flesh, because of those sinful desires that lie within the flesh. And what this tells us, friends, is that there's never time to rest. We must always be at war, on guard, in battle. And we understand that this battle takes place within the mind. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal. They're not wood and steel. They're not swords and guns. However, they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So we cast down imaginations, which come from the mind. We cast down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, against the truth of God, against God's word. And we bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, having in a readiness 
being in a position of being on guard to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. And that's why Paul finishes chapter seven by saying, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, that with my mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And so what Paul is identifying here is the difference between the flesh and the spirit. And as he moves into chapter eight, he's going to spend a large portion of this chapter explaining just that. But he begins in verse one by simply saying, therefore, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But we can't stop there. There is only no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus if they are walking not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And so Paul, in identifying the fact that we are at war among ourselves, within ourselves, the flesh battling against the spirit, the spirit battling against the flesh, we must crucify the flesh daily and we must walk in the spirit so that we no longer do the things that the flesh wants to do, but instead we obey what the spirit wants us to do. It is he who leads and guides us into all truth. And it is he unto which we must be most sensitive in hearing what it is he has to say to us. And that's why Paul says in chapter seven, verse six, we no longer walk in the oldness of the letter under bondage to the law, but we serve in a newness of spirit. And so there's life in our service. There's joy in our service. It's not a burden to serve the Lord. It's not a list of chores that we must perform but it is a joy to find new opportunities each and every day to serve the Lord through the service that we provide to others. Well, friends, I love you. I'm so grateful again that you're with us this morning. I pray that your life is being transformed and renewed day by day as you place yourself under full surrender and submission to the teaching of the word of God. Now, as he wills and until next time, friends. I truly love and care about you, and I'll see you on the next video.